Just here, here. I know. Just. No, they are already on. Yes, no, no. I'm just many times. So it's I'm only to do it. Hello? Yeah? A little yeah, more? That okay, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. And uh, so you mind if I check your real quick? You want me to stand up? Oh, no, you can. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah. Talk for me? Uh, testing one, two, three, four. Perfect. Okay. All right. I'm going to mute the mics upstairs and I'm going to cut them back on once we begin the program. So. All right. Thank you.
Um, Do I? No. no. Hello? Ooh. Hello? Okay. I can't. Okay. I, I'm going to avoid it. Hello? I make a mistake. You know. You know. Hello? Welcome everyone to the 2023 John Bro Symposium, The Changing Labor of Global Journalism, Relationship Tools and Power. My name is Mariana Fontaigna, and I am the program coordinator of the Rayleigh Center. Mm. <laughs> Before we get started, I'd like to go over a quick housekeeping points. We have built in time at the end of today's conversation for our keynote panelists to answer some audience questions. So please hold all your questions until the end of the keynote panel. Now I'd like to introduce to Dr. Joshua Grimm, Interim Dean of the Manship School, I'll turn it to Dr. Green for opening remarks. Thank you, Mariana, for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Manship School to welcome you to the John Bro Symposium for 2023. Um, as Mariana mentioned, my name is Josh Grimm, and I'm the Interim Dean here at the Manship School of Mass Communication. This symposium aims to push the boundaries of debate around an aspect of media, politics, and public policy. Today, we will hear from experts in global journalism as we work to generate new empirical and theoretical insights to aid practitioners and scholars in their future work. That many of you have, been willingly, have willingly traveled so long and so far to be here serves as a reminder to us all of how important our work in global journalism is. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to the director of the Riley Center, Dr. Janae Slocum. All right. Thanks, Dr. Grimm. Um, too many things to hold. <laughs> All right. So, um, before we get started, first I'd like to um, express my great appreciation for everyone who helped to bring this event together. Um, it's a true testament to teamwork um, that brought this event together today, and it. it demonstrates uh, just how successful we can be when we do that. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Ruth Moon. Um, this is her brainchild. Uh, <laughs> um, in fact, uh, I think she had worked here for less than a semester when she brought this idea. Um, and at that point, we already had a couple of uh, bro symposiums um, in the pipeline. And then we had a pandemic. And so this got pushed back a whole lot further than uh, I think we ever expected. Um, I'd also like to thank some other folks on the Riley Center team. Um, we have decided that we're adopting Haley Booth. Uh, <laughs> she is uh, Dr. Moon's GA, but she's been really instrumental to helping pull this together. And part of that is that uh, Mariana Fontania uh, she's a former graduate assistant at the Riley Center, but she came on full time. But we had a, a period of time where we weren't sure how we were going to pull this off, along with some of our other events that we have planned this semester. But uh, Mariana, anyone who's interacted with her knows just what a professional she is and how amazingly organized she is. Uh, so thank you. Um, I also want to thank the rest of the Riley Center team. We're really lucky to have uh, a couple of graduate assistants, as well as a number of undergraduate interns. And they really uh, are just a fantastic team. And it's fun to work with them. Um, and it's always fun to see them uh, see these sorts of things come together and that their work really comes to fruition. So can we do a round of applause for all of them? Thank you. So at its heart, the, the Riley Center is partnership-driven, action-oriented, and dedicated to exploring contemporary issues at the intersection of mass communication and public life. Uh, obviously, at a mass comm school, talking about journalism is something we do a lot. Um, and we really wanted to focus on some of the big changes that we've seen in global journalism. Um, and, and clearly, that is something that, that we, knew, we do need to be talking about, because the way that that labor market looks and who is doing those jobs and how that affects them personally. Um, it, it really changes kind of the way that, that international and global journalism look. Um, and we're gonna look into these with our keynotes this afternoon. And just so you know, to give you a little background, we also have a number of other scholars who have come in. And so tomorrow we're gonna be workshopping um, different pieces of research and writing that they have done and the hope uh, is, or rather the intent, is that we want to do a special edition in um, an international journalism uh, journal. So that's what we'll be working on tomorrow, but I'm really excited to now turn this over to 
Dr. Moon so she can share a little bit more about our guests and our moderator and how this came about. Like this? Is this good? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Janae. Uh, so we're here today. I'm going to move so I'm not standing in front of the people I'm introducing. <laughs> so we're here today to hear from two people with a deep bunch of experience in global journalism. They have done foreign correspondence and other sorts of global storytelling dating back to the 1960s. These folks are here to start a conversation about the challenges and opportunities of global journalism work and how that work has changed over the past 60 years. Tomorrow, uh, a group of expert researchers will use this discussion to incorporate professional experiences and needs into their own projects. Um, and this year's symposium is uh, designed to help researchers stay connected to the real world challenges that global journalists face today. So I'm going to introduce our keynote panelists. First, we have award-winning global journalist Jesse Lewis, Jr., who has over 40 years of experience in journalism, diplomacy, public affairs, and crisis management. Our second keynote panelist today is journalist and award-winning author, Dr. Anjan Sundaram. He has reported as a freelancer for the Associated Press and the New York Times, um, reporting on conflicts from the Central African Republic and other places. And his two current books, uh, Stringer and Bad News, are perhaps very soon going to be on sale at the LSU bookstore. They're supposed to be in now, but I don't think they're in quite yet, but you can go pick them up soon. <laughs> and next month, um, Dr. Sundaram is releasing his new memoir, Break out, break up, break, break up. Yeah. <laughs> so be sure to check it out. Um, and then finally, we're pleased to have Uyen Diep as today's moderator. Uh, Uyen is a PhD student in the Manship School and a foreign correspondent herself. Um, she covers US affairs for Tanyan newspaper in Vietnam and reporting ASEAN, a Thailand-based project. Uh, so Uyen, I'll turn it over to you to uh, to guide our discussion. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So now please welcome uh, the presentation from Mr. J Jesse Lewis. Jesse Lewis. Yes. Thank Great. you, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Professor Slocum, uh, Dr. Moon, and uh, to Jinx, uh, Professor Jinx uh, Broussard, who made this uh, possible, and to recognize my daughter who flew all the way from New York just to hear her daddy <laughs> speak. <laughs> Uh, this afternoon, I, I, this is quite a privilege for me. I'm 85 years old, and uh, I, you know, started as, I started as a journalist in Beirut in uh, 1960. It was a startup newspaper. I was quite young, and I went to Beirut to study Arabic. And it turned out to be one of the best decisions uh, I've ever made. So I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. I'm not going to. I'm going to use the slides as prompts, not not read them, because I'm too far away to read it, and I'm, I'm not looking in the right direction anyway. But I'm going to talk about how, uh, how things have changed. Of course, in the old days, it was smoke signal. And the next uh, image is a telegraph uh, uh, set. When I was in Jordan as a, as a reporter during the Six-Day War in 1967, the Reuters office used telegraph. It wasn't quite the same, but it was a telegraph to send stories back to their headquarters in London. And of course, when I started as a journalist in the, at the Washington Post, they used teletype machines. I mean, there were no such things as dial-up telephones. And computers, I mean, you know, word processors, it was way before even Wang. I don't know how many of you remember Wang. Maybe one or two of us do. I'm not going to look in any particular direction. <laughs> and, and then, of course, we used mobile phones. I mean, right now, there could be an event. and Phones would be, but it was a movie, I think, with Morgan Freeman. There was some event, and all the phones in this black tie dinner went off, and everybody left the room. Maybe you can remember the movie. But, you know, the, the media has what started back in the day where people were sort of chipping stones, and then hieroglyphics, and then the, I put a picture of the local paper, The Advocate, rather than the New York Times, because I'm not in New York now, and then uh, television. And then, of course, uh, using your mobile phones, it's the, the new media. It's the, the new media. So uh, people like me, who used to send stories back from Jordan or Egypt or from Saigon, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, um, uh, you know, it's, it's all the past, you know. These are the topics I'm going to discuss. 
Uh, I've been a journalist. I've been a, a, a book, which I published a book. That's okay. I can read it from enough. For it. <laughs> and I've done the things that you that you you still see on the screen. And afterwards, please ask me questions about any of them. You see, the last one is a, a, an aspiring uh, scholar. So I'm, you know, if anybody wants to hire me for, you know, give a good <laughs> course, here I am. I wanted to, wanted to show you uh, what it was my first. Uh, first front page story in the Washington Post. I was just what they used to call a club reporter, an intern. And uh, my mother used to keep the clips and you know, you can't imagine, you know, I really, that she would make something special for me when I got home, which used to make um, a cake. But the great thing is I did as a child was to lick the batter off of the spoon. I don't know how, if you all uh, have ever done that, anyway. So that was my first, um, uh, story in the Washington Post. This when I finally I w went to Vietnam, and this was an ad that they put in the paper. I'm a little bit, uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I'm looking at two screens here. Please forgive me. Uh, I went to Vietnam as a reporter, as the second person in the, in the bureau to report about the black GI, the African American soldier, this black American Air Force pilot and, and, and people, as well as the Navy, as well as the Marines. And I had the good fortune to meet some not only wonderful people, but some American heroes. I did a lot of Saigon politics, uh, stories about pacification, but I concentrated, everywhere I went I had two notebooks, the story of the day and the other notebook, every black face I saw I said, hey, how's it going bro? And I wrote down their stories, what they, what they wanted to do, how they felt being there. And in Vietnam, uh, we uh, black Americans, maybe 11, 12 percent, they were 30 percent of the casualties. And the dynamic was that you take a kid from you know, Baton Rouge or New York, they wanted to show their toughness and they would volunteer for the dangerous long range uh, patrol, to call them LERPs. And they would go dig a hole in the ground, eat from a, a can, if there was an edible snake, they'd do that to try to intercept, uh, you know, to go behind enemy lines to pursue the war. And they did most of the dying. Somebody invented, you know, war is hell. They attribute that to a general, but I'm sure it was some black kid from Chicago who, who got shot up and, and died early. Anyway, that was a, a, a break for me. Uh, maybe you can do it, uh, and, and I, and have, because I, I don't want to really turn around. One of the stories that I did, I flew in the back seat of a f Phantom F-4 aircraft. At the time, that was the hottest plane in the American inventory. How many of you saw Top Gun 1 or the second Top Gun, uh, Top Gun Maverick? Were well, you looking at the real deal there? This guy, when he walked into a room, he exuded South Carolina. He was about 6'4", and it turned out he was from Baltimore, just up the road from Washington, where I grew up. But we went to the same camp as kids. We were, there was a four or five year difference in our age. But when I met him, it turned out we both went to Camp Atwater. And I had already uh, learned how to fly when I was in the Air Force, not as a pilot, but on um, the weekends, just because I wanted to uh, get away from the, the food and the chow hall, I went to the airport to eat in the uh, restaurant. And I, this was Wichita Falls, Texas. And blacks in those days, 1955, could not eat in restaurants in Wichita Falls. So the only place that I could go that was kind of not segregated off base, of course, was, it, was the airport, the Wichita Falls Civil Airport cafeteria. And Wichita Falls shared the runway with Shepherd Air Force Base. And I would go there every Sunday. And I met um, the, the uh, flying instructor. And he said, we'd speak. And then one Sunday, he says, you want to learn how to fly? I said, can, where can we start? So I learned how to solo, you can change the slide. I learned how to solo in the Piper Cub. It, uh, that's the plane on the, in the lower corner. But I was, flew with Tim Body in the back seat of the Phantom on an airstrike. And um, say what you want about the war, but that's over. But he, he gave me, after he discharged his ordinance, he gave me some stick time, gave me a few minutes of control at, uh, of control at, the, uh, at uh, flying the plane really stands out. He, he died uh, recently and I went to his funeral at um, Arlington National Cemetery. At the time he was a major and he retired as a brigadier general. You can change the slide please. 
Another story I did when I was in Vietnam, uh, it was right after an operation called Junction City, which involved the first parachute jump of the, uh, of the war. And I, I went in, on not, not in the parachute, but in what they used to call the first stick. This was the first 10 helicopters of, a, of 10 groups. So helicopters, 10 helicopters, a few seconds later, another 10 helicopters, and they didn't even touch the ground. The guys jumped out of the side. And they assigned a 19-year-old kid to look after me. He'd done these before. And he said, don't worry. He said, don't worry, Mr. Lewis, I'll take care of you. And he did. That evening, I went to a, um, keep it there. That evening, I went to a medevac hospital. How many of you remember the television program, MASH? Well, in real life, it's called MUST, Medical Unit Self-Transportable. It's almost, you, it, you, it's, you pop it up out of a box. It consists of several buildings that are interchanged, but they can erect one in about 18 hours. It has the scalpels, the beds, the bedpans, and everything. And I went there uh, at this, the first day of Junction City, and in those operations is when uh, everybody, that's when most of the dying is done. And they brought in a kid uh, from Chicago, uh, one bullet wound, and they said, uh, um, they don't use the word stat, this is get the operation, operating room ready. And I asked whether I could attend the, uh, go in the, in to the operating room. And they said yes. I've been there a couple of hours and chatted with the people. And um, everything was done to save his life. I, I'll send the story to anyone uh, that would like to read it, but I tried to capture the horror of war, the, the tastes and the smells and, and the sounds. And I tried to do that in the article. I remember one line, you know, after about three or four hours, a lot of blood was given, and somebody said, is this, this guy still alive? They, because the people who were doing the operating weren't monitoring his vital signs. And somebody says, yes, he said, gee, we must be doing something right. And then somebody else in the operating room quipped, hey, isn't there a, bed, a, a beer ad like that? I don't know how many of you remember uh, that. Anyway, but to capture the reality and the sadness and the horror of the war. And you noticed uh, how that article was placed above the fold. I mean, you read the advocate every day, and so the advocate is usually the name, the masthead of the newspapers at the top. Well, you see where they put my story about uh, attending the operation. And I also did, at the end of my four or five months there, a, um, a story uh, about the, the, what the black GI did. And that, too, was placed above the fold. The Washington Post only does that two or, two or three times a year, if that. Uh, that I mentioned to some, I, I was in, I then went to the Middle East and I was in the hotel when the, the Jordanian Prime Minister was assassinated. I happened to be just around the corner and I heard, some, and I thought it was a stack of uh, suitcases falling off of a dolly. And I saw some guys running through the cafeteria or the coffee shop with guns and I went in and there was the Jordanian Prime Minister still the uh, bullets were fired at very close range and his jacket was still smoking. So, uh, was there a question? Sorry. I was in the trenches and I'm coming to the end of my, uh, uh, my time now, not necessarily the end of my slides, but I'm sure the slides will be made available uh, to those of you who would like it. But I look forward to hearing, we can keep, uh, keep going. Those are some books that I was involved in, another slide. I was a crisis manager as well, as well, and the next one. Also, I'm trying to make a documentary film, and then, and now I'd like to, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the old guy, and with my daughter's help, I found some, uh, she's a professional photographer, I found some images on the web. So I, I'm, I'm now passing the baton to the future. Not only is he the future of journalism, he's also the next speaker. <laughs> okay. Yes, now your turn. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Right. I, uh, I can scarcely imagine what it was like to be a foreign correspondent uh, in that time, and more so an African-American foreign correspondent, mm -hmm. um, and the challenges you might have faced. Um, and the world of journalism just seems so different now. Mm -hmm. And so thank you. And I look forward to discussing more when we do our Q&A afterwards. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for 
Thank you to Dr. Moon for inviting me here. Thank you to the center, to Dean Grimm, uh, Dr. Slocum, uh, everyone who's made this event possible. The organization has really been uh, spectacular, uh, so smooth, and a uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, Dr. Moon had mentioned that the way she uh, learned about my work was her advisor asked her to read my Rwanda book, uh, my second book, and uh, decided if she still wanted to go to Rwanda, so I'm happy to report she did, and she still went to Rwanda, so it didn't disappear her. Uh, that was great. And, uh, and it's an honor to be among some, uh, some eminent researchers whose names I, I've, no, I've known, and, but I lacked a face uh, because uh, when, when I was doing research, and it's uh, great to finally meet uh, a bunch of people uh, working within journalism in a scholarly and in practice. Uh, I'll structure my talk in three sections. Uh, so I'll quickly describe my, I'm the author of three memoirs of journalism, so I'll quickly describe those. I only have one slide, and so that's it. <laughs> uh, so I'll quickly describe the, the books. Uh, I'll summarize uh, my research for my PhD, uh, which sort of draws on the work from the books. And then I'll come to what I'm doing right now. I'm a journalist in Mexico. And uh, I'll describe my project, and sort of then we can move to the Q&A. So uh, the three books I've written are called Stringer, Bad News, and Breakup. And uh, they're all memoirs of journalism. The first is in Stringer, set in Congo. Uh, Bad News is set in Rwanda, and Breakup is in the Central African Republic, so all Central Africa, African countries. Stringer describes how I, I was studying mathematics uh, at Yale, and I was on my way to do a PhD, and then I quit, and I bought a one-way ticket to Kinshasa, and became a stringer for the Associated Press. And uh, uh, a few years later, I then became a, um, a journalism trainer in Rwanda, training about a class of a dozen journalists, Rwandan journalists, print journalists, who were taken out by the Rwandan government one by one, so shot dead, imprisoned, forced to flee Rwanda. And uh, uh, I, I, I tried to record their stories uh, and pay some tribute to their brave work in bad news. And Breakup uh, describes the war in the Central African Republic. Just in the, in the weeks as uh, rebels were uh, preparing the ethnic cleansing of Muslims in the country, and they, and they succeeded in doing that uh, to a large extent. And I happened to travel through the country with a colleague from Human Rights Watch just in the weeks uh, preceding that. It's quite rare to report on a place just before as genocide or ethnic cleansing is being prepared. Usually journalists arrive late or, or never. Um, and there's a reason I chose to write all three books as memoirs, which is kind of odd and rare as journalists. Uh, often I, I, I like to report on situations that are remote and underreported in my, in my understanding of situations. And so the first story, the impulse for going to Congo and writing that book in the first person was to tell the, some of the stories from the war there, which uh, uh, you know, even though four or five or six million people have died in that war, you don't find it on the front page of newspapers. And so I decided to tell that story in the first person because I thought, my sense was that there wasn't broad uh, interest in, in the war in Congo. People seemed to be fatigued, uh, tired of it, and I thought if I write it in the first person, maybe people might be interested in my story, and then through my story, they might want to you know, read about the war and what's happening there anyway. And so that, that was an impulse for the first book, and it's sort of translated now all three, and it's now become a, a, a story of me, a project of me kind of, kind of chronicling my life as a journalist and the different personal phases that I've been in and gone through uh, and using my personal life to uh, tell stories about situations or places that you might not read about quite often in the mainstream or you know, uh, regular media. Um, and this has sort of led to some you know, particular choices, and we can explore that more maybe in the Q&A. Uh, I think it's interesting that this conference is about labor and journalism because all three books uh, touch on different aspects of labor and this was a subject of my PhD. Uh, the first book is Stringer, the second book Bad News is about Rwandan journalists, the local journalists, and a, a principal character in the third book, Breakup, is a, a Central African fixer. So in all three books you kind of go through 
what we might call the underclass of news production in the world, stringers, local journalists, and fixers. Uh, and, and in the PhD, I was uh, exploring post-colonial models of international news production, and all three categories of journalists might be considered subaltern reporters. And one of the, one of the uh, things I developed in my PhD uh, was a post-colonial model of international news showing how news production, at least in my experience, uh, on the bottom rungs of the news system uh, mirrors the colonial process by which uh, you know, colonial officers would be sent out from the global centers, London, uh, you know, uh, colonial capitals, but in news it might be London and New York and other places. Uh, so colonial officers were sent out from the centers to the peripheries. They administered the peripheries. They appropriated subaltern labor, transformed it, and sent it back home. Uh, often the, the subaltern producers of that labor were uh, under-rewarded financially or in terms of credit. And so there's certain parallels in the news system whereby foreign correspondents go out, often work with local fixers, local journalists, who don't often receive a lot of credit uh, for their, even though their contribution is, is uh, crucial and essential to the production of international news. Um, and, I and I discussed in my PhD the implications of the system. For example, in Rwanda, President Paul Kagame, who's you know, a, a, an author authoritarian leader there, he, he's very concerned with controlling international news about Rwanda. But <coughs> because he understands that international correspondents parachute in to Rwanda often and rely on local journalists, Rwandan journalists, for their information, he realized that he doesn't need to control the international press. All he needs to do is control the local press, mm -hmm. and then all the information that's going to the international correspondents is automatically controlled. And so he's been very successful in that strategy. And so that and other implications are you know, things that I discuss and from my personal observations uh, in the field. And so I'll come, coming to the last bit, uh, I'm now in Mexico uh, reporting on indigenous environmental defenders. Uh, another group of very important actors, I think. Uh, indigenous people worldwide make up about 5% of our population, but they protect about 80% of our biodiversity. And in this age with climate change, uh, they're particularly important for, to protect the remnants, the last remaining pristine ecosystems that we have. However, uh, they receive very little attention and protection, uh, partly you know, because of poverty, because they're in remote areas, and also because of historical racism. And so in Mexico, it's quite rare. Mexico is the most dangerous country in the world for environmental defenders, 54 killed in 2021. And it's quite rare to see them mentioned in the national press at all. Um, and so I've begun a project with a Mexican reporter. And we're, we, last month, we went out on our first road trip and we went to a few sites in interviewing and meeting some of these incredibly brave and inspiring uh, environmental defenders uh, and recording their stories. And we just published our first piece in the LA Times about the work that they do. Uh, and we're hoping that this project will expand. We're going to different areas. And uh, we're, I just wanted to mention also that we're, op we're in the sort of conception phase of this project. So, well, if anybody here is, would be interested in collaborating in some way academically or practically, we're, we're, op we're absolutely in the phase where we're open to collaborations and looking you know, uh, to share as much as we can. Uh, interestingly, in terms of labor, since that's the topic of our conference, uh, we were wondering, Raphael and I, we were traveling on our last road trip, and we were wondering how we would fund these trips in our project. Um, and uh, he had an idea in the middle of one of our trips. He was like, why don't, why don't uh, you share, or we each share, uh, what we make, what we earn from our stories from these trips uh, equally? And I thought that was quite a bold uh, <laughs> proposition because he's a Mexican journalist and he's publishing mostly in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the major national newspapers, Reforma, offered him $20 for a 2,000-word story. Uh, and, and obviously, I, I would make a little bit more, but I, I thought about it. I thought, you know, <laughs> quite bold to suggest that, but I thought about it, and I thought, you know, this is exactly right. This is exactly what we need to do, because the market may not value our work equally, but at least as a team and our project, that's what we should do, uh, and that, that's what will make the project uh, viable. And so some of the findings from my PhD, there was an element of practice, uh, praxis now, where we're, we're changing the way the traditional 
relationship between an international correspondent such as myself and a local reporter, and we're changing that to make it more equitable. And though I pointed out many inequalities in the PhD, for the first time I'm experiencing uh, putting, the, putting you know, what, what we should be doing into practice, and that's kind of exciting. It's just been two weeks, so it's brand new, and uh, I'm still you know, experiencing it for the first time. I'm like, am I doing the right thing? I thought this, he was pulling a fast one, but then I, you know, it's like for a moment. <laughs> because it's so established, the way these ways of working, they're so established, and now it feels like we're in totally new territory. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's a brief introduction to you know, what, I, what my work and what, what I'm doing now. It's, uh, I, I look forward to the conversation and excited to discuss past and present and you know. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you so much for an insightful presentation. Okay. And so now I just go ahead and ask questions because I can't wait to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the characteristics and skills that foreign correspondents should have? Questions for both of you guys. Curiosity. And don't be turned off by the first dozen no's. <laughs> I don't know. To have, um, uh, to be tenacious and to be curious. And to go where, don't be afraid to go where the answer you're looking for is. <coughs> and just don't take no for an answer. Look in unconventional places. And if you push, I don't mean being, you know, uh, like an elephant, and uh, I don't know what they, but I mean to be, but you can be tough without displaying abrasiveness. I'm not talking about being abrasive. I'm just talking about going at it in a deliberate and intelligent fashion. Because if you think the answer is there, it's going to be there. That's great. How yeah, I guess uh, one of the most important things I think is uh, identifying a local if you're going to be a foreign correspondent, identifying a local partner, a local journalist with whom you can work. I know it's changed a lot from Jesse's time to now, but I find it's essential when I show up in a place, I, I don't know much about the place, and I need to work with someone mm -hmm. who's followed the story for years, sometimes decades. Um, uh, I, I, I received a no, you know, number of pieces of advice when I first went out, and they've kind of all held true. I, I, I was told to take a shower and eat whenever you got the opportunity. Uh, I was also told uh, just to just be persistent. Uh, I, I remember my first AP editor, I just kept, kept calling him, kept writing to him, and just didn't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, until, and he, he, would, he would tell me, Anjan, I don't have time to tell you why I'm not publishing your story. You know, I'm handling 23 countries, I'm receiving copy in French and bad English, and I need to do all this research. I don't have time to talk to you, but I just kept calling him. And, uh, and eventually he's like, all right, I'll, I'll explain to you, and that's how I got my education. That's <laughs> interesting. So what are the challenges of being a foreign correspondent in co foreign countries, and sometimes you need to change places? Well, I, I was um, fortunate as working as a foreign correspondent as contrasted being with a journalist for a local newspaper in Lebanon. I went to the Middle East to study Arabic. I had already taken Arabic in America, and I went to improve it. So my, my job at the newspaper, quite apart from the journalism part, uh, was being a sort of an interpreter, a translator, if you would, between the newsroom and the uh, press room and the typesetters. Uh, the editor was a retired uh, Reuters car, Middle East correspondent for, the, for Reuters. He was uh, an older gentleman. At the time, he, he was a little bit younger than I am now. But, he, uh, but they needed a, somebody who spoke English, had native English, but also could be a, a bridge between the press room actually setting the newspaper. And um, I had that language skill. And when I went back as a foreign correspondent later to cover the war in 1967 and to be a foreign correspondent, by the way, I should mention that I was a student at the American University of Beirut when I was working at night at the newspaper. So I went back to an area where people I went to school with were, had jobs in the Libyan government and the, Canadian, and the uh, Egyptian government and the Jordanian government. And more importantly, uh, the Palestinians that I went to school with were getting involved in the Palestinian uh, political movement. So I'd look up old buddies. And they remember me from sitting in the, you know, the campus or captain's coffee shop drinking coffee. And so I didn't, there were no barriers to break down. They were glad to see me again. 
And when they found out I was working for the Washington Post, uh, they couldn't, they couldn't wait to tell me. I mean, I'd ask a question. They wouldn't even have to ask a question. They would tell me uh, what was on their minds. Um, so it's, it, I think it's, 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 it's it, it, when you have the opportunity to have local knowledge. So um, I was just fortunate to cover the Middle East War in, in an area where I used to go to school and knew the language. And when I went back as a Middle East correspondent of the Washington Post, I was in an area where I had language access and familiarity of living. It wasn't the same in Vietnam. We needed the, the, the kind of tools and hum, human tools that uh, Anjan uh, uh, described. But I was just fortunate to be in an area where there was news. It helps when there are events to report or developments. Mm -hmm. And there's no pleasure. Uh, I mean, if you work for the advocate here, you know, the governor's going to read your story. You know, it, it's like washing, you know, uh, washing your teeth. Only that person will, can do it. And if you work for a newspaper that's published in a state capital, and if you work for a newspaper that's published in Washington, which is a national capital, you can be guaranteed that your story is going to be read by the consumer. It's not going to be press safe, taken out, clipped, by the way, it's sort of a, a summary. That person will read it over the coffee or right after they wash their own teeth. They'll read your story and talk about feedback and impact, there's nothing like it. Sorry, my apologies, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> so what are the challenges of being a foreign correspondent in foreign country? Oh, yeah. Uh, for me, I guess the, the, the greatest challenge was uh, trying to get people to uh, purchase the news and the stories. <laughs> uh, I remember in, in Congo, when I went to Congo, I was 22, I just graduated. And I didn't know what the news was. I'd never written a news story in my life. And I learned literally over there, you know, reading the Reuters reports. I was, I was a stringer for the Associated Press. I would read the Reuters reports and mimic the structure and like understand how news was written. But I was living with a Congolese family I, at the time. They happened to be the cashier at university in the States, their family. And so I convinced them to let me stay in their house in Kinshasa. That's how I went. And I remember the, the news that I would uh, publish was so different from the news that they would, the stories they would tell at home and the news that they would listen to on the radio and what they considered important. And I would talk to my editor at the AP. For example, there was, I remember there was a story uh, that I heard on the radio. There, were, there was a large group of women uh, protesting at the United Nations headquarters against uh, like sexual harassment and rapes, committed, some committed by UN officers. And they were breaking down the door. I remember I called my AP editor and I was like, you know, and he was like, and he asked me, any, any, any shootings? I was like, no, anybody dead? No. Uh, he was like, nah, not interesting. Like, it's local baseball. We're not interested. And yet in Congo, that was such a big story. And so there was this big gap between the local news and the international news. And here I was in the middle trying to survive, you know, get my 10 cents per published word as an AP stringer and, you know, make enough money to make a living. And so it was not only in my interest to survive, to figure out what sells and what didn't, but it became a kind of an a investigation and exploration to understand. That's what I explore in the book, sort of, you know, why are certain things news, international news, and why are many, many things not? Uh, and so much of the book is sort of me trying to figure that out, also for my survival, but also out of curiosity, you know? Mm, yeah. So, like, do you think what are the main differences between foreign correspondent? compared to like others of colleagues, for instance, uh, for journalists covering like current affairs in the, their own country? You take that oh, first. Sure, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I don't see so much of it. I'm just grateful that foreign correspondence exists because I love to travel, I love to write. And you know, my initial idea was I just want to travel and earn my, you know, earn my way and uh, write stories, travel stories, whatever they were. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to fund my travels and my curiosity about the world. So I, I think ideas about foreign correspondence are also changing. People are questioning you know, how, how much, you know, should stories about a certain place be told by people from that place? Uh, what is their participation? You know, how much uh, should they be uh, credited or acknowledged? Uh, and foreign correspondence, as I mentioned, you know, as I studied in my PhD, is that there's a lot of colonialities about it. And so uh, I think it's evolving, I think, in a good direction. But I'm just grateful that it exists as a profession, mm -hmm. as a possibility that you know helped me get out and see the world and uh, satisfy my curiosities until today, even in Mexico, 
um, I moved from reporting on human rights you know, situations in, in, in wars and dictatorships um, in Central Africa. Now I'm reporting from the environmental front lines, which I think, in my opinion, is uh, the most important front line facing our society today. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm glad that I can make my life align with what I see are global priorities. But it also pays to have a good editor. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> contrast with a freelancer. I mean, the Washington Post used to have freelancers, and they'd pay, call them stringers, and they would literally pay them by the word. Two cents a word, five cents a word, you're really hitting the high end when you got 10 cents a word. <laughs> but, you know, so a freelance reporter who works on that basis would try to sell a story to the, to the foreign editor, to the newspaper, where there might not have been any interest on the, on the other side of the line. But when you were a foreign correspondent staff, you always had to justify your existence because you're out in the Middle East or in Cairo or in, 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 in Kuwait or in, down in Dubai, in the old days in Dubai. And uh, you had to justify that you were there. It wasn't, you didn't get an increase in pay if you wrote a story or not, but you had to justify your existence. And you often would be reminded of that. But the editors play a, a very keen role. They will give you indications they will say, well, no, why don't you write a story about that? Because they have the view in Washington. Yeah. And it's a view you wouldn't have had in the old days because there was no CNN. So the, the editors back home in Washington, particularly in Washington, uh, they, they have their pulse on what is, is important. And uh, often things would happen that are what demand are apparently important enough to go and write a story, to travel to Cairo, for example, or to go down to Amman, Jordan. So it was a partnership between the foreign editors, the newspapers, the people back in Washington, and the person in, in, in the field. And it was always that interchange. But often you didn't have to wait, because in those days there, was no, um, there were no direct dial phones. And I remember once uh, there was an attempt to overthrow uh, King Hassan, he's, he's long gone, but he was the king of, of, of Morocco. Well, I didn't wait to get instructions to go from Beirut to Rabat. I had to fly through Paris. I, I, I was there by evening, and they were so glad that I was there. I mean, I, I told them I was going, but it was no time for feedback, no time for somebody to tell, well, don't go, don't bother. But they were glad that I was there. And each of the stories I wrote for, uh, I was there about a week, you know, all the stories I wrote, front page. Anyway. So your, question, your answer and your last answer make me feel like, how can we convince our editors to get interest in <laughs> our local views at that time? Is that a question for me? For both of oh, you. You go, you, you take it. How do you convince editors? <laughs> I wish I knew. Because uh, you, you there, you find it interesting, but probably your editors like, half of the, the earth don't know about that. I'm, what, what surprises me is that, you know, in my experience and even in other environmental reporters I've met, everyone talks about how hard it is to publish stories about the environment. Wow. Somehow the environment is somehow sort of still, you know, pigeonholed in some yeah. kind of, you know, nature or yeah, something like that. And so... Scientific nature. Yes, exactly. And so, so it's somehow it's nature and society that link hasn't percolated through the uh, press and editors, apparently. And there's still a lot of tension. I remember I, uh, I, I wrote a piece in 2015 from Argentina, from this toxic, polluted town. Mm -hmm. I went and stayed there for two weeks. And cancer rates there were through the roof. Uh, uh, there were toxic pools of effluent all over the road. You know, people's pets were dying. And uh, uh, I couldn't find a publisher for that story. Uh, and the one editor who was kind of interested said, you know, pollution is not the same as climate change. And there seemed to be kind of, it's still so nascent that uh, it was hard to persuade her that industrial pollution, you know, is symbolic of our relationship with the environment and climate change is just another symptom of that. And so she wasn't having it at all. And that piece is still not published and I, uh, it's, but I found an editor and so I'm hoping that the New York Review of Books will publish it in, in the months to come. Uh, because we've been working on it, but it's it's crazy. Like some of these stories I've been working on for seven mm -hmm. or eight years, yeah. uh, 
which is also interesting. You know, I go back and I follow the characters five years later, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking them now because the editors ask me all these questions. I'm like, you know, what's happened? What's happened? And some of their children have passed away. You know, people, uh, their relatives have developed cancer also from the situation. So it's an ongoing, uh, it's, it's interesting to follow the story over the long term. Um, but uh, I, th I think for me, there's certain pleasure and uh, meaning when I see that editors aren't interested. That tells me that there's a story and that I need to work on this. Uh, and, and often I have to fund these things myself, yeah. uh, which comes with its own set of challenges. But yeah, that's part of the work that I feel particularly excited about doing. OK. Mm. What do you think? Well, remember now, I worked at a different era. Uh, in the environment, was, there was very little interest in the environment. Uh, I was in an area of the world, in areas of the world, that would have been front page news whether I would have been there or not. And I just happened to be there and I reported it for my uh, publication. So it, in a way, um, uh, I, I was going to say I was lucky, but you know, I, I was there when it happened. I was in the room when it happened, is, I think is the phrase you see sometimes used. So uh, my work was cut out for me just by the, the natural flow of events. I was fortunate to be in the Middle East to watch the development of the Palestinian movement, which I believe is still an impediment to peace in the Middle, Middle East or resolving that, that uh, issue. Um, a lot of the other uh, issues have been uh, resolved. I was in Vietnam after the war, many years later, and uh, there wasn't an echo of bitterness or uh, I couldn't have been greeted more warmly at the airport or in the Caravelle Hotel where I stayed then, I stayed it again. Uh, it was, I won't say it was, wasn't like the war never happened, but it was just remarkable to what happened, what happened in that country, the, the, the war, that the, uh, there was no acrimony, there was no sullenness or, uh, or uh, rudeness when I went through uh, customs and immigration. It was, you know, welcome to Vietnam. That had already been reported when John McCain went back, uh, as you might remember before. But you know, things, the times change, and, and um, ruptures heal. Uh, I think that's what the good Lord intended to happen. Anyway. Yeah. So now that we can access to local news online, so do you think do we still need foreign correspondent? <laughs> Well, you, you know, I, I would really hate to, uh, you know, to depend on, sorry, but I'm not, depend on a tweet to tell me what's going on <laughs> in, uh, in, in southern France or in, in, in Finland today. I mean, the, the issues are too complex to compress 25 words or less. Um, and without with trying to avoid any commentary on what's happening in Ukraine today, I mean, there is great concern. I mean, you know, what the Ukraine has done, the... Uh, the, the, the war there, it's prompted Finland and Sweden, you know, kind of uh, neutrality personified to, to change it. They've all, both of the countries have indicated, you know, so I've, it, things have changed and it, it's hard, I think we're too close to the, we, we, we can't uh, see the forest for the trees just yet. Uh, there, I know there's a lot of, um, and even, we, I don't really know what's the next steps for journalism. It's in good hands, though. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm now interested in writing my memoirs and yeah. passing some nuggets on to my children and grandchildren, and and perhaps to some of the people in this room. Yeah. What do you yeah, think? Yeah. What do I think? Uh, I, th I I hope foreign correspondence grows. I think it needs to grow. I think it's un unfortunately been a staple more in Western countries, yeah. and I think it needs to grow in the global south. It's for me. Uh, crazy that you know I'm in I'm in uh, the Central African Republic and for Nigerians to read my story about from the Central African Republic it, the news needs to go from the Central African Republic to London yeah. and then come to them and so they don't have and Nigeria has money you know it's a wealthy economy they have the resources to mm -hmm. fund journalists they don't and the same for India and you know say Bangladesh Indians are reading news about Bangladesh from Reuters or from the Guardian mm -hmm. and so we don't I, I would like to see it. I think the curiosity about the world, about our neighbors, is a good thing. Um, and I, I don't see enough of it in the global south. And I would like to see, especially countries with you know, the economies that can do this kind of work, um, 
do more of it. I can give you an, an example that comes to mind. You know, I, I, I presented a TV show about India called Deciphering India. Mm -hmm. And after the show, the producer and I, we went to the, 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 the channel, which was a, the national channel in Singapore, called Channel News Asia. And we mm -hmm. proposed doing Deciphering America. Yeah, no, yeah. And uh, the editor said, oh, why don't you do Indians in America? And we were like, no, no, we want to do America. And they were like, why don't you do Asian tycoons in America? <laughs> we're like, no. And then I realized later, when I was doing my PhD, that the, you know, this has been going on for decades. The, the, produce, the commissioner of the channel in Singapore didn't believe we had the moral authority to go as an Asian crew to the US and report on the US on everything that's happening there. We needed to you know, find a niche and find our place. And, uh, and I, I think that's just terribly sad. I think you know we should come to. It needs to grow. To, your, yeah. to answer your question, foreign, foreign correspondence needs to grow and evolve, and become something that you know many countries are comfortable doing. Yeah, we'll talk about the future of foreign correspondence later. But I have a question direct to uh, Mr. Lewis. So, have been been a foreign correspondent for years and received like several awards. So, do you, what do you think is the big differences uh, of the? foreign correspondent during your time compared to the current state? What it is today? Yeah. Well, I, I have to guess at what it is today because I don't know. <laughs> but, but what it was in my time, what I had to overcome personally, uh, I, I might mention, if I may, uh, being, being an African American, remember in those days we called ourselves Negro and colored, that kind of parish, but, but being a, a black correspondent, one of the biggest challenges was the isolation, the ostracism that I experienced from my American colleagues, all of whom were white. I remember um, when I was in Vietnam, uh, there, was a, there were a, coupling, a couple of bars that were popular with the Foreign Press Corps. And uh, though these, these, these guys, all of them were, were men, knew me, I'd walk in, they wouldn't speak. And um, they, uh, I was, I mean, I was not on my own. We had a bureau chief there, and he was, you know, he was my boss, so to speak, but he wasn't involved in the, the black GI story that I eventually reported. And I said I had two notebooks, one, you know, politics and the other one, every black face I saw. So when the, when the black GI series started, and it was one of the stories that was uh, flashed on the screen, above the fold, it hit American journalism like a bolt of lightning. It was the underreported, not only underreported, it was the unreported story. There had been no reports, no separate, no interest in what the black GI was doing. And I talked about the blacks were dying at a much higher percentage rate than the whites reported. Through, not through discrimination, just through a, a turn of events and dynamics, in my judgment. But as soon as that happened, couldn't imagine all the people who tried to be my buddy. And I um, said a certain many things that I don't want to use in a mixed gender uh, uh, audience, some of them silently, but they even asked for my carbons so they could, you know, which they didn't get, of course. Got a few choice words instead. So uh, the biggest challenge that I had as a foreign correspondent was not, um, not talking to, to sources even in the, in the middle, but dealing with other American journalists. I was the only American, only American journalist in the Middle East who spoke Arabic, in the Arab world, spoke Arabic. None of them did. The British had one or two, mm. but no other American journalist in the Middle East spoke Arabic. And the guy who took my place in the middle didn't speak Arabic. And the guy who took his place didn't speak Arabic. I mean, I, so the challenges, um, anyway, I mean, the challenges, I didn't let it all get me down, though. I mean. It, uh, I hope I don't come across as arrogant as I was back then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's still a, like an issues like today for a foreign correspondent. A lot of like Western journalists come to Asian uh, countries, but they don't speak any Asian languages. So that's quite a. And for you, I have a question for you. You worked for like several years and then returned to school and acquired your PhD. Uh -huh. So. What brought you back to the university, and <laughs> how has the grad school benefit your career? Uh, I think, so my PhD was uh, the research that I did. I had two professors. One was uh, a journalist and a writer. His name is Giles Foden. He wrote The Last King of Scotland. And there was a more natural 
understanding of why I chose him as an advisor. My second advisor was unexpected. The university assigned him to me. His name was uh, Anshuman Mondal, post-colonial researcher. And I learned so much. That was when I, like, you know, all through my research, I was reading about all these colonialities and news. I remember calling all my colleagues, my producers, and being like, hey, man, you know the, that, you know, that the time that the producer said that to us, it, just, it wasn't just us. It's been happening for decades. You know, this is a whole thing. There's all these books about it, and we had no idea. It yeah. kind of speaks also to, I guess, to, in some sense, to the divide between academia and, uh, or scholarship sometimes and uh, practice, uh, a gap that I think you know, would benefit from uh, being bridged. And in my own case, I became aware of you know, the, the fact that I'm now focusing on indigenous environmental de uh, defenders in Mexico uh, is directly, I think, a result of, of that research. Uh, it also gave me some time to reflect on my experiences in the field, uh, which I think has been invaluable. Okay. And yeah. Okay, come back to the future of the co foreign correspondent. So, at the moment, lots of news organizations, they cut their budgets and close their foreign bureaus. So what does it mean to the future of global journalism and the production of international news? Well, I think the, the, the villain is this. <laughs> is it the villain? I mean, well, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, okay. but not, not entirely. I mean, you don't need to send somebody to, uh, to London or to Paris, or to Kinshasa, or to Dubai, or Cape Town anymore. I mean, you can get, and you can pick and choose uh, from the news production from those countries, and you can run it through your own filter at the newspaper, because you, many, most, uh, uh, most newspapers have uh, uh, foreign people who understand the political dynamics and the significance of events, and they can run these facts. You have to really decide what is fact and what's not fact. But I think all of that uh, is because of the uh, ease of uh, electronic communication. It's not Twitter as such, but Twitter is certainly re is a function of that. So the idea that you send somebody to the Middle East to be your correspondent, only a few news organizations will, or, or have the muscle, the financial wherewithal to do that anymore. And even fewer, once you leave the East Coast, um, is there a, a, enough readership interest? And it's now measurable. I mean, polls have gotten really sophisticated. There may not be the interest to, uh, to, to, to justify, uh, uh, the level of interest may not justify the expense of sending your, your own correspondent. That's my response now. I guess I've been interested to see how journalism has moved or is moving in very small steps from a highly competitive industry to uh, now being more collaborative. That's, you know, when I showed up in Congo 15 years ago, um, Cong the Democratic Republic of Congo is half the size of Europe. It's all of Western Europe combined, France, Germany, Spain, all of those countries you know, together, that's how big it is. Mm -hmm. And it's the site of this you know, very important story. We were, I was the fourth foreign correspondent to show up for all this territory. And I showed up naively thinking, you know, we're all going to collaborate because there's so much news. And we're, we, you know, there's not enough of us to report it. And I uh, was, you know, unpleasantly surprised to find out that nobody would talk to me, you know. Like, none of my colleagues wanted to speak to me because they were afraid I'd steal their story. And, you know, it was so competitive. My editor would call me up and be like, why is Reuters getting this before you? And why is the BBC? And I was like, Man, there's so much stuff here happening that's unreported. This, this seems so petty to focus on, on uh, you know, whether I'm a few minutes ahead of the Reuters guy or not. Uh, but I recently, you know, with WikiLeaks and you, we've seen Panama Papers, we've seen these large projects where all these different news organizations on different continents are collaborating. And that's been nice for me to see, see more and more journalists comfortable with the idea of working collaboratively on projects, not one-upping the other by publishing first. They publish together. Yeah. They receive the information together. They share their insights. I think that's, I think, maybe a function also of the financial pressures that you're mm -hmm. mentioning and other factors as well. But it's, I think it's a welcome and you know, positive trend in our industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. So now we will open the floor for uh, the audience questions. I know that you guys have a lot of questions for our panelists. 
here. Yes. Yeah. Um, please wait for the mic. And I I'm would like stand. to ask you to share your journey because you didn't just show up at the Washington Post one day. No, I, I did um, not. It seems <laughs> that you began working there after the integration of the newsrooms mm -hmm. and when a lot of star black reporters went to the mainstream media. Well, so was your background in um, African American journalism or how did you wind well, up at well, that newspaper? Well, I, 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 I might have mentioned it, uh, I, I think I was talking about it somewhere. I, I, came back, I came back to the United States after spending two years in Beirut, where I worked for an English language newspaper in Lebanon, which was my first contact with, with being a journalist. And the weekend I got back was Labor Day weekend, and I got back on a Thursday, and that Monday's a holiday, but in the Sunday Washington Post, there was an ad for copy boys. They don't call them boys anymore, but that's another story. And I got there on Tuesday morning to apply. It was called personnel then. Then it, now it's called human resources. So things, a lot of things have changed. <laughs> and I took a brief aptitude test, about 10 minutes. It was the kind of test you really couldn't complete in the time they gave you. And I did pretty well on that. And I took a spelling test, which I mis uh, failed miserably. <laughs> and the, lady, the, 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 the personnel officer said, well, you did pretty good on the aptitude test, but not on the uh, spelling test. I said, well, you have to have dictionaries upstairs. And she kind of looked at me. But, but you know, didn't say, come back. So I, first time back in the States in two years, walked around, you know, uh, look up old friends, got back home. The city editor had called my house four times. He says, can you come in tomorrow for a job? I started on, on Thursday as a, as a copy boy. So um, my experience, though, as a black journalist in the newsroom, at the time, there were only two black journalists there, but Dorothy Gilliam and uh, Wallace Terry. Uh, Wally is dead. He went to, on to Time magazine. He, he sadly died. So it was, and the reason that I was hired as a copy when later became a, a reporter uh, was they wanted to hire black faces to go into the riot-struck uh, neighborhoods. And so much so that it didn't give bylines. We had to get on the phone and give our, the facts to somebody other than the phone. Well, it was a complaint. That changed. But the, the black journalists who started, uh, the reporter, started in the 1960s, cut their eye teeth. And we were rewarded, in a sense, because there was a civil rights movement. I wouldn't have gotten my job and had, had not been interested in black news. And I don't think I would have gone to Vietnam to be the number two to report Saigon politics had it not been for the, the black angle. But there was a substantial black angle. It just wasn't to talk to black journalists, I mean black soldiers. There was a substantial black angle to it. And, then, and one thing was that the involvement of African Americans in Vietnam had been ignored. Had been ignored. You remember I talked about the, the first parachute jump? The old Life magazine had a three, four page photo spread on that, that uh, parachute jump by the 173rd Airborne. And they had this almost a traditional photograph of looking down the, the plane, you know, people, the, the guy sitting there with it. There wasn't a black face in it. It was impossible. 40% of that group was black because I was with them the day after they jumped. The, uh, the operations commander, basically the number two, was a black guy. And I remember seeing the bodies stacked up. Uh, but there were too many bodies to put in the coolers. They were being evacuated. I'm talking about dead bodies. 50% of them were black. So it was an underreported story. And, and the, the, um, the American newspapers and news organizations had not reported that. OK, uh, just a quick follow up. Yeah. Um, did you go, or in your role as a foreign correspondent, did you see yourself as a reporter who was primarily objective? Were you a champion of the race, as so many of the journalists who worked for the black press did when they were doing foreign correspondence? They wanted to tell the story of blacks worldwide. And um, so a lot of them had a certain perspective 
when they went overseas to cover any number of stories. And where do you fall in that line? That's a potentially tricky question now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to answer it uh, uh, candidly and honestly. I've always, always b believed, I reported it as a story. I didn't go in to report what this, see a black face and ignore what was happening otherwise. It was the underreported contribution mm -hmm. of black GIs that had not been reported, that, that I reported on. Um, I believe that, um, I, I never thought, I mean, if we were reporting, you know, a speech of Martin Luther King, I mean, I've met him, Malcolm X, I met him, not, hey, Jesse, come by the house for a drink tonight, but, you know, here, there I'm in the, and they, and always these guys, these people made a point of shaking the black reporters in there. I remember attending a, a speech from Malcolm. He says, all you black reporters out there, I got your job. <laughs> and that's because there was a, th erroneously, that the, that the uh, Muslim movement, the, the Nation of Islam, wouldn't let white reporters in, into the hall. That just wasn't true. But he made a point of being sure that everybody understood why we were there. And we, that's why we were there. But I, I, uh, I, I don't feel uh, there was a role for the black press. I mean, Ernie Dunbar of the Amsterdam News, Chuck Stone of uh, the Afro-American in, in Washington, D.C. But I was there as a re black reporter to report for a general circulation a news organization. And uh, I saw stories just from my experience. It would be like uh, uh, somebody from, uh, I mean, I thought that the black element was underreported, but it was always an American story. I mean, I've never really seen myself as, um, uh, I mean, I realized my value, but I never saw myself as an advocate for any particular view. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd write a story of, uh, about, I'll write a story about anything. I hope that answers your question yeah. in, in a safe way, <laughs> pr Professor. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I can draw or take a little time, it's an analogy. If you have a, um, a woman who is a um, renal specialist, I, I don't know, I forget what the term is, and she's not going to only be for, for women. There may be unique feminine issues, but it's not, a, a, I mean, I don't know how many women are gynecologists and how many men are, but if you have, a, 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 say, a woman brain surgeon, I mean, there ain't no difference between a man's brain uh, I will argue, and, uh, and they say, and a woman's brain. So, you know, it can't be, maybe in some parts of the world where they don't want uh, male doctors operating on, on women, but that's changed now. Uh, so, um, people are people, and you know, all these barriers are breaking down. You can't imagine the, the barriers that don't exist now that I, I remember very clearly, and that have impacted on my own personal life and professional life. Yeah, we have a lot of questions over there. Thank you both so much for being here. This has been very informative. Um, I'm really curious, just going along with the theme of the changing lo labor of global journalism, Anjan, I have a question for you. Um, thinking about like how many foreign bureaus have shut down and how there's a lot of reliance uh, on freelance reporters and you have these freelance bureaus yeah. where you can basically pick somebody, and it's mostly Western outlets, and I know China also does um, uh, look for those stories from these certain bureaus, and you're just relying on somebody to go in there, write you a story, come back and get paid for it. How do you see, I mean, do you see this as being problematic or as an opportunity? I, I really love the idea of these potential collaborations, but right now it's kind of like a pay-to-play mm -hmm. game. You're absolutely right. It's incredibly hard, and there are so many barriers to entry. Uh, your question made me think about, uh, I wrote a piece published when my first book came out. I, I published a piece in the New York Times opinion page called We're Missing the Story. Mm -hmm. And it's about my experience as a stringer. And every time I called the AP and I said, you know, I'm just 
uh, summarizing. Every time I called the AP and I said, you know, I need some money for this trip to report on X, they were like, oh, our Springer budget's shot, shot. we don't have money. And then uh, when the elections happened in 2006 in Kinshasa, uh, the AP sent like, I don't know, eight person team, and mm. they invited me for dinner with them. It was at the Grand Hotel, which as you can imagine from the name. <laughs> uh, we, we were dining on foie gras, and I did the math for like how much the rooms got. The rooms were $300 <laughs> a night. And I calculated that in one night for that staff, they, they consumed two months of my budget. And you know, in two months, I could produce dozens of stories. <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't that the budget wasn't there. It was misallocated, in my opinion, for the wrong, you know, producing the wrong kinds of news. And my takeaway from that, and that's why I wrote the opinion piece, was that if I was out in Kinshasa and experiencing this, there's m there must be stringers all over the world who are hungry, you know, uh, ready to work, educated, and you know, uh, willing to work on a shoestring budget and just for the love of their work. And they're not getting the money. And I think news, uh, the New York Times and all these newspapers would benefit, I think, I and, and it's I international news producers from restructuring their budgets mm -hmm. to account for uh, this huge stringer population, which I think could be even larger than it is. And I completely agree with you. Like I was paid 10 cents per word published but my AP editor was kind to me. He wouldn't count the number of words. He would just pay me extra. And I was like, that, that's not what I, what I what you guys publish. But he would just pay me extra. And uh, it shouldn't have to depend on a kind editor here or there. You know? uh, and I should have gotten health insurance. I was working in these you know, risky places and uh, in conditions that are, I think, unacceptable. And stringers today are still working in those conditions. Certain things have improved in some ways. Um, since what, what some of the things that have happened in Syria to freelancers and mm -hmm. in Iraq you know, with ISIS and all these things. There's been more attention to the conditions of freelance workers, but I think uh, structurally, I actually think there's a case, a business case, with international you know, publications and channels to stop relying on the celebrity reporters and paying them huge budgets and sending them out and you know, uh, harnessing instead the, the, the talent and the hunger among mm -hmm. the international, you know, stringer cohort around the world, mm -hmm. uh, and I, yeah, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, I don't. I, I see them paying more attention, but I don't see mm -hmm. stringer budgets or freelance budgets. It's it's a pittance to often paid for stories, and I think they actually have the money. They just <laughs> don't see it, or <laughs> there's too much inertia. Yeah. Uh, some of my foreign correspondent friends would tell me, well, they work their way up the ladder to become those foreign correspondents, and you know, you get those fancy paid trips you know, around the world, and so they, they, they would feel shortchanged when the systems change. I, I suspect that they're part of the problem, but, <laughs> but I think news could improve. Uh, and I think that would, it, it would allow for better quality news, and maybe we'll solve some of the financial problems, both costing le better news for lower, lower costs seems mm -hmm. like a no-brainer, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I think you, you could see more changes mm -hmm. in that direction would be helpful. Yeah. So we can have one more question. The, the issue I would like to throw out, if may I, Sorry, Madam no, Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> not to be answered here. There's not enough time, perhaps. But um, t TV news as opposed to print journalism. And there's two observations. And maybe it's food for thought for, the, for next year's seminar. Um, and I'm not going to stick my, not going to step in the same hole that Don Lemon uh, put his foot in the other day. But there's, there is a tendency for the networks, I'm talking about the people that do the hiring, uh, to put on, on screen people who are fancy, who are you know, competing for the, the, to be uh, on the front pages of a, of a fashion magazine. They don't use the same measure for men. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a flaw. The exception to that, and she's a stellar exception, is Christiane Amanpour. I looked her age, I think she's 65. She's the best in the business. I, I, she's one of, uh, even better than any of the men they have. And she has just, because of her uh, apparent and manifest uh, savvy and, and, and uh, control and smarts, uh, that's one thing. The other thing, that just food for thought. In other words, I think there should be more space for women who may not qualify as, as, um, as models. I mean, it's, it's, it, because it's an intellectual uh, 
knowledge activity, not one of uh, physical appearance. The other thing is, uh, and that's TV news, and this is a bit of a prejudice of mine. You will have on any day, there's a plane crash and there may be a new development in Ukraine or a war and somebody, mm -hmm. but they'll say, but wait a minute, we have to bring you what, what happened to Justin Bieber just now. He stubbed, stubbled, uh, stumped his toe as he was emerging from a thing. And that happens. I'm being facetious now because that's pretty trite, but not much. And, you know, think about that. I mean, here you are in, in this environment, uh, you're, you're able to wave the flag in a, in, a, in a very powerful way. But so much of the news, particularly television news, has become so trite, so meaningless, as opposed to the, the more meaningful things that can be reported and that are not reported. So I'm just, I'll, I'll sit down, I'm an old man, and just you know, whatever. <laughs> no, I think you just drive it up. <laughs> yeah. And I will turn it over to Dr. Moon. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> she stole the mic away. Okay, so I have a rapid fire question for all three of you. And Uyen, I'm gonna start with you. Um, this is, tell us one thing that you think students, researchers, and others in the academic community, so basically this audience, should know about the experience of working as a global journalist or storyteller. Uh, could you repeat the question, yeah. please, just so I, I get it? Tell us one thing you think students, researchers, and others in the academic community should know about the experience of working as a global journalist or storyteller. Uh, I go first, or who you want to go first? You can definitely go, go first. Uh, the, 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 the practicality, the nuts and bolts of it. You know, how do you, how do you um, get your story back to, wh where do you go to get the facts for your story? Pick the people you want to talk to. Pick the subject. Think about it before you, you know, you put uh, sword to shield for the first time. Think where you go, what you, and think about not what you'll say, the content, but think about how you'll say it. But you have to decide what needs to be reported. Now, if in a conversation a person say, oh, and by the way, I saw a spaceship land yesterday, <laughs> you kind of change your focus. Uh, but, you know, to kind of have a, have a plan in mind, to have a plan, right. Yeah, I might just repeat something I read. Uh, it was in a column by George Monbiot in The Guardian before I went out to Congo. Uh, he, he said a lot of people wrote to him asking for advice about how to become a journalist. And he said many people chose to take the traditional route, work in Metrodesk, you know, local paper, and then get sent abroad. Mm -hmm. And he wrote in that, in that article, he said, you know, my advice is if you want to go and report on the Zapatistas, go do it now. Uh, don't wait. Don't wait seven years. You'll be a different person, and you know your priorities will change. Your life will have changed, and that was I. It influenced me a lot. I remember thinking it redoubled my sort of confidence and commitment to going out. And yeah, I, I would say the same. If you want to be an international journalist, just go and do it. There's plenty of places, as we all mentioned, where there's important things happening. Maybe the news industry doesn't value it. Maybe there's not enough news being produced, but there are plenty of news out there. And you can go out there and, you know, you can make a career, you can make some kind of small difference, maybe not change the situation, that's a bit ambitious, but uh, you can make a contribution. And I think there's, to keep that in mind, uh, it's hard, it's a hard business. And I think having that purpose in mind helps me, you know, face the challenges every day, reporting and getting things published. Thank you. For me, I will say uh, our home country bias, kind of a big hindrance to cover international news. So just try to understand the local context before reporting something about that country. Mm. That's all I say. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you very much. And I, th I would say that that advice goes for anything, especially if it's to go get out of the country and see part of the world, don't wait uh, for certain conditions to be met. Otherwise, you'll, you might be waiting for a very long time. Um, so again, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today for this conversation. Um, a special thanks to our, our keynotes. 
um, and to Union. Um, and I want to let everyone know that if you would like to see uh, this production again, you can find it on our Manship School YouTube channel. We'll also have a link on the Riley Center page. And any of the resources, um, Jesse's uh, presentation, for example, anything that's been mentioned, um, we can, we're going to be posting that on the website as well if you'd like to find that. Um, and I'd also like to mention that even though our bookstore has not gotten an Anshan's books yet, you can find them online for purchase. So if you're interested, please, uh, please look for those and for his new book. Um, I'd like to also encourage everyone to, if you don't already, uh, follow the Riley Center on all of our social media channels. I won't go into the details of those, but uh, we're not that hard to find. And you can uh, see all of the other really great events that we put on throughout the year. Um, actually, our next one is on March 22nd. It'll be here in the Holiday Forum again, and it's with uh, Emily Ramshaw. And if you don't know who she is, She's a former editor of the Texas Tribune. I think she was the editor. And then she went and founded the 19th uh, based on the funding model. Uh, so she's got a really great business story, a really great news story. So um, even if you're not going to be with us uh, in person, you can watch uh, the live stream or watch it on YouTube as well. So uh, I hope I get to see all of you again. And again, thank you for coming out and for sharing this conversation with us. And I had just a footnote. You know, you have a, a, another professor in your midst who's also has published several books, and I tried to find some of them at the bookstore. They they're not available. They, I think perhaps they might be. Considered. I think uh, if we if we were talking about Dr. Broussard's books, we're, we're uh, talking we, about uh, Jinx Broussard. Yes. yes. Uh, so actually, that's through LSU press i believe and that's the best place to go to get uh some of her books where else have you been publishing uh dr broussard yeah okay um yes uh, unfortunately um I, I don't believe our our bookstore does the best job of carrying some of our academic uh publications which is unlike some of the other uh um, you know, campus bookstores that I have seen, but you can certainly find uh, any of those publications online, and I do encourage you to to, to look for those. And Dr. Broussard's book is uh, an amazing book. I, I got to read that when I first came back here to, to work here. So please uh, take a look if you're interested in African-American foreign correspondence. All right, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, nice job.